Hey, good morning, everybody. This is Pastor Hilton, and welcome to our 2020 Leadership Development class on this morning. It is a great Tuesday, and I want to welcome you and say thank you for tuning in this morning on this awesome day. Pray that you're doing well. Pray that you're up and at it, getting ready for the day. So I bid you a great welcome and uh, say God bless you. And while you're logging on and just kind of finding your way through here, I just want to uh, make mention that this is a awesome day, um, awesome week for us as a church and some of the things that we are attempting to do for the Lord. And I just want to encourage you to get involved in some of those uh, areas of ministry that are available to us um, tonight of, or yesterday. Of course, I want to say thank you for coming out for our intercessory prayer meeting and all of the, the different uh, meetings and practices and things that took place. And then tomorrow night is our midweek service. So I want to challenge you to come and be a part of that and grow with us um, in our church at Bethel Family Worship Center. And then on Thursday night will be our food pantry outreach where we'll be connecting with people in our city and loving people in a practical way, sharing the love of God in a very tangible way of helping them and helping people with their their food situation. You know, uh, we are a church that is not only maturing in Christ, but we're reaching in love. And one of the ways that we do that is through our generosity of giving and serving people that are in need. So I'll challenge you uh, tomorrow night, be at church on Wednesday night, midweek service, as we gather together for the purpose of discipleship, also fellowship and worship. Uh, we are fulfilling the great Com, uh, the great commission where Jesus told us to go into all the world and make disciples. So we are disciples who are being discipled and making disciples at the same time. And so discipleship is essential for any growing Christian to be found in a place of discipleship. So not just coming to church on Sunday, that's and that's not any extra, but coming also for discipleship and training and not only having the word put in you, but also hands laid on you and application um, and surrounding yourself with believers who are uh, running after God the same way that you are. So I want to encourage you to be with us Wednesday night, also Thursday night for our outreach of serving our community and food pantry. And then, of course, we start Vacation Bible School next Monday. It's going to be a great great time on starting Monday night the 16th of July running till Thursday night the uh, uh, the 19th of July so I want you to come out and be with us for this help us serve and sign up get your kids registered it's gonna be a huge huge thing for us so God bless you is my prayer on this morning and so let me let me share with you my heart today I want to talk about serving uh, with devotion and one of the things that we've been you've been hearing a lot in our congregation is this word devotion and what does it mean to be devoted unto something you know the Bible teaches us about devotion and I'm, in fact I'm going to read out of 1st Corinthians chapter 16 this morning and talk about this how to serve with devotion and I'll also be addressing some things concerning the consumer spirit or what some would call the shopping spirit and how people jump from place to place depending on whatever the best deal they can get and so let's pray and go right into the scripture this morning in 1st Corinthians chapter 16 verse 15 through 18 and as we're praying and as we're into this I would ask you to share this Facebook live and also um, as you feel prompted uh, share your uh, your your thoughts as well and and uh, and also hit the like button and the love button and all those uh, little emojis that populates uh, the live stream as it's happening and it spreads it out a little further let's pray father I just ask today that you would bless our time together and growing and becoming what you desire us to be and I ask God that you would just like a laser Focus in on the areas in our life that need to come up as a leader, as a Christian, as a Christ follower. Help us to become what you desire us to be, what you envisioned us to be. 
And Father, we will give you the praise, the glory, and the honor. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Uh, I found a scripture that I thought was was uh, powerful, and it's always stuck with me um, when it comes to the word devotion, uh, to devote yourself, to be devoted. Um, when you use that word devotion, you conjure up the thought of being committed or something that you are running after, that you are single-minded, focused on. And the Bible talks about a man by the name of Stephanus, who Paul had helped him in the ministry. And we read about him when Paul was giving his final uh, address there in 1 Corinthians chapter 16. And he began to admonish the, the church and to give them his thoughts upon his departure and those that had served with him in ministry. And the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 16, starting in verse 15, he tells this, this story and he, he introduces this man by the name of Stephanus. And he says, you know that Stephanus and his household were the first of the harvest of believers in Greece. And they are spending their lives in service to God's people. I urge you, dear brothers and sisters, to submit to them and others like them who serve with such devotion. And I read that passage, and I've read that many times, but when I read it uh, in particular into the theme and the thematic of spirit that is in our house at this moment concerning devotion, uh, not only when our, we are devoted to God in worship and devoted to Him and having personal set of time to devote with God, to have this devotional time, but also in the a verb form of uh, devote myself, to be devoted, to be considered to be a person of devotion. That he, call, he that Paul says, Stephanus, who was the, some of the first converts in Greece, is known as a man who his whole house and his family um, and all of those, his whole household, were people that served in the ministry. They were people that served and also began to, from that day forward, begin to serve um, the rest of their lives, serving God's people. And Paul said that the, the church should submit to them um, or that the, the body should submit to them and others like them who serve with such de devotion. And of course, Paul's in a situation where he longs to be with the church in Corinth. So he says to them, I'm very glad that Stephanus and Fortunatus and Achaeus have come here. He said, they've been providing the help that you weren't able to give me. And I love this because then he goes on to say this about them, that they were a wonderful encouragement to me as they have been to you. And so he said, always show appreciation to those who serve so well. Paul is setting up uh, this man to be received, his whole house, as people who are introduced as people of devotion. And, you know, I thought, what, what, what do you want people to say about you as a leader? When, if someone were to stand up and introduce you, and say, coming now to the platform, or coming to, to speak for this banquet, or speak in this moment, let me introduce to you someone. Uh, what would they say about you? Would, would they say that you are devoted? Would they say that you have served well? Would they say that you have given all that you have without complaint, without criticism, or would they say, well, um, listen to only half of what they have to say because they don't live half of what they say themselves. Uh, what do you want people to say about you? I want people to say about me that I was devoted unto the Lord and that I spent my life leading people to Christ, leading God's people, lifting up the name of Jesus, building the kingdom of God, not building my kingdom, not building an empire unto myself, but building the kingdom of God and holding to a solid conviction that what we're doing works. And running after God and living for him wholeheartedly is not something of times gone by. 
but it is definitely of something now that we must adhere to even more so as we see an evil day approaching. We must, we must be people that are devoted to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so we live in a day uh, where what I consider church consumerism. I saw and had a dialogue yesterday with pastor who was uh, putting out the thought of this, you know, people have no loyalty. They go anywhere that they get the best deal. Um, we are living in a day of church consumerism. A consumerism is kind of like a term, you know, that we're familiar with because we deal with consumerism on a daily basis. It, it, you know, consumerism shapes how you purchase things. It, it relates to how you shape your identity. When you are talking about consumerism and even the spirit of consumerism, consumerism can even affect our spirituality. And let me just say it like this, that we have become consumers. We are looking for the best deal, the best uh, uh, benefit. We are looking at what's in it for me. What do I get out of this? And the very moment I feel I'm no longer benefiting or I'm no longer getting something that is of value or worth, then I start shopping and I take on the consumer mindset. Mm, there must be something out there better. Long are the days gone where we used to stick with something for a long time, even if it wasn't producing the results we wanted to see in the, in the, in the now. But our forefathers understood that you have to put a seed in the ground and stick with that seed, water that seed until it begins to sprout. And when it begins to sprout, it's not over. There must be fertilization. There must be rooting and uprooting and pruning. And there must be a cultivation to bring that plant and that fruit into a place that is of value. And it is an ongoing process. So our forefathers understood that you have to stick with something. You can't just uh, say, oh, that's not for me. I'm not happy. You can't just give something six months, six years and think, well, I've seen all I can see. Because there is yet more the longer you begin to process and go for um, more fruit and run after greater levels of multiplication. It takes time to develop. It takes time to get to a place where you see great dividends and results and sometimes a lifetime uh, where you can look back over your shoulder and say, the Lord enabled me to walk through that and now my children and their children will be the beneficiary of what I went through or what I sowed in righteousness, God's going to bring a harvest. So you cannot have this consumer uh, uh, mindset because the consumer mindset will affect you spiritually. And basically this mindset creates an exchange where we expect instant result for our investment. I want it right now, you better give it to me now. You know, it's amazing to me the people that are uh, uh, confirming their calling and announcing their calling and saying, I'm called of God, uh, that want something now, that want an investment now or a return on their investment now. You know, I spent many years serving with my mom and dad in ministry and also others that I've served with in ministry. And you cannot have an instant return on your investment. You have got to put in your time and sow your seed into the ground and allow the Lord and the Holy Ghost to develop the fruit from that, and it takes time. You know, my studies and even my personal experience of why people, you know, jump from church to church after spending years volunteering their time and giving of their service, I've discovered there's a few things that stand out when I interview those people or I begin to observe their life because usually their pattern will be whatever they did at the last place, they'll do this place. And then when they leave this place, they'll do the same thing the next place. It is a pattern. And only you can break that pattern. But I've discovered there are things that stand out in the way that people jump from ship to ship. Sometimes it's because they feel like they've been ripped off. Um, this feeling of maybe just I've been taken advantage of. And these people didn't appreciate me. And... Uh, they don't know the value of, of who I am and what I bring to the table. 
And so there's this feeling of I feel ripped off, so maybe I need to start looking for another place. And then I've also encountered where there are people that have felt like they've given and gotten nothing back. Um, you know, I put all this time in, I put all this energy, you know how much money I've given to this church, you know how much work I've done for the Lord, you know how many hours I've spent, you know, teaching these kids, and what am I getting out of it? You know, I don't feel like I'm really benefiting. I don't get to do this, I don't get to do that. And that's when you see that spirit often where people feel like they've given and they've gotten nothing back. And you have to also ask yourself, who were they doing it for? You see, you have to come to a level of maturity as you're serving so that when you are serving, you are also receiving. You don't do it to receive, but you will receive if from your pure place in your heart, you are serving with humility and honor unto God. You don't care if they ever put your name in lights or if you're ever mentioned from the platform, if you're ever recognized um, and they name a day in the, in the year after you, you are giving not to get, but you are giving because it is more blessed to give than it is to receive. So some people feel ripped off. Some people feel like they've given, they've gotten nothing back. And then they, some people view discipleship not as self-sacrificing service, but rather as a consumer exchange in which there again, they're looking for an instant gratification. And some people who should know better, they, they serve in ministry and then they're almost like saying, well, I did this, so God, you owe me that. Pastor, I did this, so you know, you better cut me some slack. It's, they're, they're not serving in a self-sacrificing service they're serving to get something. They're serving so they can have notoriety or long, you know, their name being mentioned or people uh, to say, well, they've been around a long time. They've, they've got more clout. They are on, high on the totem pole. That's not how Jesus works. Jesus uh, says in his kingdom, if you want to go up, you got to go down. You have to decrease so that he can increase. And so when our view of discipleship is no longer self-sacrificing, hey, whatever the church needs, hey, whatever the ministry needs, if they need my time, I'm there. If they need my talent, I'm there. That's the mindset it should be. But the mindset it seems to for so many people is a consumer exchange. What am I going to get out of this? You know, I'm going to put some time in here, but bless God, they better let me sit down at the front of the line when the, the next church chicken dinner, I better be be given a private table and it should say reserved on there because I'm somebody. I've been serving God for all this time. And, you know, that's the mindset of a shopper, of a consumer spirit. And so when I've had conversations with people, it seemed to me that they are just happy to follow Christ and follow Jesus and serve him as long as it brought them some kind of exchange here on earth. It's like, I'll do this for you, God, if you'll do this for me. Listen, God, you don't play, you don't play let's make a deal with God. He's not Monty Hall. Uh, you don't play let's make a deal with him. You don't uh, say, I'll select door number two, please. You don't do that with God. You do what he says to do as long as he says to do it, and you do it with a Christ-like spirit and a heart of gratitude. You know, the kind of spirit we see in the world today did not come from heaven. The kind of spirit we see even in the church sometimes of people who want to serve only if they are recognized, that did not come from heaven. That did not come from the Holy Ghost. And there's a disillusionment when people take on this consumer spirit. You know, and of course the advertising industry, my goodness, um, you know, all this stuff that we are exposed to uh, has thrown faith out the window because now we just want to do whatever makes us feel gratified and satisfied. And so when we follow Jesus, not because we're expecting some type of payoff or expecting God to, if I scratch your back, you'll scratch mine. When we follow God because we're not expecting a payoff, then we're going to find something that's lasting. But if we follow God only to get a consumer payoff and to feel uh, paid like uh, we got what was due us, 
And then we have a faith that's not going to last. And you won't last long in a place of ministry or a place of leadership if what you're doing is only so you can get something. If only you can get something. You know, uh, many years that Beverly and I have been serving in ministry, we've been actually serving as lead pastors here at Bethel for about 19 years. Next year will be 20 years. Um, we have learned some things that you cannot just jump ship because you don't feel like that you're getting the payoff. You're getting uh, what you deserve. Longevity is paramount today. If you're going to build something lasting in ministry, you've got to stick with it. You can't throw in the towel just because you don't feel like you're getting your needs met or things haven't turned out to your liking. One thing that I believe and I've said before is that roots produce fruit. If you have no root, you have no fruit. And you've got to stick into a place long enough that your roots run deep. Deep enough to begin to produce a spiritual harvest and even branches that come off of your life that other people will find shelter and shade and find themselves in a place of being blessed because of you being fruitful for a period of time. You know, when we worship God, um, you know, we worship him not because we believe that he's going to make all of our dreams come true. We worship God who um, is worthy of worship and service and devotion. And believers who live their life, you know, and their faith through the pattern of consumerism, of just getting something from God, almost always these people end up outside of ministry outside of church, disappointed and disillusioned. Uh, I've been in church all my life. I, I was raised in a pastor's home and I've been surrounded by ministry all my life. I'm thankful, so thankful for my upbringing and the heritage that my mom and dad poured into my life and my wife's parents poured into hers. And one thing I can specifically remember about um, our parents is the amount of time they invested and they devoted themselves to the church and to the Lord. You know, my mom and dad would clean the church. They would shovel the snow. They would mow the yard. They would pray for our pastors. There were many times I would hear them crying out to God in prayer. And before we would even go to bed at times, we would pray. And, and, and my mom and dad would lift up our pastors and say, God, touch our pastors. God, minister to our leaders. I watched my mom and dad teach Sunday school classes and teach wherever they were asked to, drive buses. My my dad had a bus route. He would get up early on a Sunday morning, so early, just to go around and pick up people and bring kids and bring moms and dads who had no transportation and teenagers and, and bring them to the house of God. And then, and then go through all of service. They didn't have multiple services, but they had Sunday school and then they had morning worship. And then after that, drive those people home. And, you know, he'd get home real late in the afternoon and mom would have food. And, you know, those were sacrifices that were made for the ministry. I watched them attend meetings where they were asked to be. And to, I've watched them support leadership. I've, I've watched them give financially. Mom and dad to pledge unto the Lord. My mom and dad were tithers and, and still are to this day. And they give financially. I watched them participate in activities. Anything that the church was doing, they were there. They were involved because they believed in the vision and the dream. Not just to get something. Not just to say, well, I want to make sure pastor saw that I was here. No. They did it unto the Lord. Every service that was the church was offering, they were there. That was possible. My dad worked multiple shifts. He worked in a factory and also uh, served in ministry. And just every time the doors were open, they were looking for the opportunity to be found faithful. If my dad couldn't go, you better believe my mom had us in the house of God. If my mom couldn't go, my dad had us in the house of God. Us kids, we were in the house of the Lord, surrounded by faith because mom and dad knew this is the atmosphere I want to plant my child in because I'm not so much considered concerned about the temporal as I am the eternal. I want to make sure that I'm preparing them for the Lord's work. And so that's why they would attend every service possible, serve, 
wherever they were needed, day or night. Mom and dad would work and serve in ministry, make meals for people who were uh, sick or, or some type of benevolence was needed. And there were many times that my dad would be called out at night to pray for the sick or visit someone at the request of our pastor. And my dad would jump up and go and do what needed to be done. I have no regrets in that. I don't look back and think, man, I wish my mom and dad weren't so committed to God. I, don't, I wish my mom and dad weren't so faithful. No, I don't have any type of uh, feeling like that. I'm so thankful. And my mom and dad did all that before they worked full-time in ministry. <laughs> they worked full-time in the factory and, and just kept on going for God. And God blessed them uh, amazingly, has blessed their life. And they did it without complaining. I never asked, seen them complain about it. Um, or ask for anything in return. I never, that was never passed on to me that you do this only to get something back. In our home, there wasn't an expectation of receiving something for our service for the Lord. I never heard my parents say anything about being owed something. They viewed their service as unto the Lord. We're doing it for Him, Jesus Christ, our King and our Savior. And of course, they served their leaders as they served the Lord. And for that service, I believe the Lord honored and blessed them for their commitment. In fact, I believe today I'm serving where I'm serving because my parents served with an anointing upon their life. And you see, none of us will be able to lead our own ministry if we can't serve in someone else's ministry. Oh man, let me say that again. You'll never be able to lead your own ministry if you cannot first serve in someone else's ministry. And for that matter, serve with integrity, serve with honor, serve with character, and serve with distinction. Oh, I've met many people along the way that serve as long as they're getting something out of it, as long as they get something out of the deal. And, and I'm just telling you that's the nature of some folk. But we are called to serve one another. And the Bible says, unless you can be faithful with that which belongs to another man, you'll never have your own. And so many people want their own ministry. I've had people in the church say, you need to put so-and-so in this ministry. I'm like, uh -uh, no, 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 you don't dictate uh, what the Spirit leads. You don't tell uh, the pastor, put so-and-so in that ministry. That has to come from the Holy Ghost. And, and not only the prompting of the Holy Ghost, but also the people that are serving have to serve with integrity and honor and character and distinction and devotion. Not only that, but they got to do it over a season of time where their fruit yet speaks. And then the trust is there to serve with the with uh, with honor and blessing. And it's not um, it's not a who you know, it's not who was here first, it's never like that. It's the prompting of the Holy Spirit. And that's how we live our life. God, I just wanna be used of you wherever you wanna use me. And you know, and knowing that has kept my feet on the narrow path and my heart content to be happy wherever I am, serve wherever I'm told, and whenever, uh, and, and however long I'm told to serve in those areas. I've been very content in life to just be part of the team. I don't have to lead it to serve it. I don't have to be the lead for it to work. I can serve wherever I'm needed because I know where my call is. I know my calling is to the king and I'm doing it unto him. So, you know, I ask a question um, about this serving with devotion. You know, Paul had a couple, uh, had a married couple that served with him who were tent makers uh, Aquila and Priscilla, and they were very, very, uh, very helpful in um, in Paul's ministry, and they followed him. And so I will ask you a question, and here's the question. Who are you going to follow? Are you going to follow someone with a proven track record? Are you going to follow someone who has longevity on their side? Are you going to follow someone who has taken a licking and kept on ticking? Or are you gonna follow someone whose character is questionable? Their motives are uncertain. They're never in any one place too long. Do you know that your advice is only as good as your advisor? Now hear my heart, who you follow determines where you end up. Who you follow determines where you end up. So who are you going to follow? Another question that I would ask you is this, 
How are you going to follow? How you follow determines what you get. How you see your leader determines what you receive from your leader. How you perceive is how you receive. In, in my own life, if, if I've wanted something from my pastor or from my leader, not in a greedy way, but I desire the anointing on their life, I desire, desire the mantle upon their life, I made myself available to them and became a shadow in their life. I mean, everywhere they were, they didn't have to wonder where I was. My pastor never had to wonder if I was going to be at church. My pastor never had to wonder if I was going to be there. If I couldn't be there, even if I had held no title, I called, I communicated, and we didn't have text messaging back in that day. Boy, I'm dating myself. But my pastor never had to wonder where I was, never had to, to search over the audience and scan the crowd and wonder, where's so-and-so? Why aren't they here? Man, they need this. My pastor never had to wonder about that. I was there. I served. I've become a shadow. Not in a way that I'm trying to be seen or trying to get in on the inside. You don't have to worry about that. If you, if, if you become close, run after something, I'm telling you, the thing you were trying to apprehend will I apprehend you. The spirit of ministry, God of God will just come right back on your life and apprehend you. It's the squeaky wheel that gets the oil. So you have to position yourself to receive from your leader. If you're a no-show or you're following from a distance, then your leader will not be able to lean on you when they're tired because they can't find you. Your leader can't be refreshed if you're not there and near enough to bring water and refresh when, they need when they're frustrated and need encouragement. So anything that I've ever done and anything I've ever desired from my leader, I was there as a shadow in their life and I followed close. I didn't follow from a distance. You know, sometimes people get their feelings hurt and they start feeling disenchanted and disillusioned and they just start becoming distant. Do you know that your leader notices that when you become distant and you're not hurting them, you're hurting yourself because the leader in your life is a gatekeeper to bring you into your future destiny. So you have to always remind yourself, you're not doing this for yourself. You're not even doing this for them. You're doing it for the king and as a benefit that will ultimately come through principle, your children will be blessed. So how are you going to follow? You're gonna follow close or are you gonna follow from a distance? Are you gonna follow with your arms crossed or are you gonna follow with your arms hands out, ready to do something, ready to help? ready to refresh, ready to give, ready to serve. So it's not just who you're going to follow and how you're going to follow, but here's a third question. How long will you follow? How long are you going to follow? If you view your place of service as a stepping stone till something better comes along or until you are the one who's eventually calling the shots, then you're never fully going to learn what you need to learn where you're at because your mind is somewhere else instead of focusing on your God assignment now. A lot of times people just say, well, I'm only here for a little while until something comes on. I'm only here so pastor can teach me because then I got my own ministry. Bless God, I'm going to get... No, 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 no. Mm -mm. Leadership and ministry is not a ladder you climb. It's a road you travel. And Elisha served Elijah for 10 plus years, and he would have continued to do that longer, no matter what, until Elijah told Elisha that he was leaving and he was going to entrust him with his anointing to fill his shoes. Elisha was hungry to receive everything he could from Elijah. He was hungry. He wanted to receive something from his leader, but he was content to stay where he was planted. For there, the anointing accumulated in Elisha's life. I want you to think about that. How long will you follow? Elisha followed for 10 plus years. He didn't say, man, I'm never going to get used. Man, I've been here already this long. I can't believe I've been here this long and I still don't have this and I still don't have that. Man, I wonder if somebody else out there is doing something. I can join with them because I'm not getting what I need here. 
If I'm ever going to be what God wants me to be, I got to leave here and find me somebody that's going to help me. Oh, no, 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 no. Elisha, a farmer, jumped, left his family's business, left his 401k, left his own industry, and ran after the man of God. And there was a hunger in his heart to serve the man of God. And the Bible says to us that Elisha poured water on the hands of Elijah for 10 plus years. He became known as the water boy. Where is the one that poured water on the hands of Elijah? Elisha was hungry to receive everything he could from his leader, but he was content to stay where he was planted, for there was the anointing accumulated in his life. And one thing I admire about Elisha is that he didn't take ministry. He inherited it. And that's the difference between a hireling and a son. A son will inherit the ministry, but a hireling will take it. A son is sent. A hireling went. Which are you? Elisha was content where he was until his leader called him out. And his leader sent him forth. My God, we got it backward in the ministry today. Too much showboating, too much everybody wanting a name and a title. Another thing that I love about Elisha is that he didn't start getting goofy by withdrawing from his leader or getting himself in a bunch of mess. You know, there are times when people, because they don't feel like they're getting the benefit, hence the consumer spirit, they're not getting something out of the deal that they start getting goofy. They start acting weird. They sit in a different seat. They look different. They act different. They Their face is different. They don't talk. They don't communicate. They withdraw themselves. And they act like they do. They, they almost act like they feel like they're so grown that nobody could add to them anymore. My God, I wouldn't want to be in that place. Jesus teaches us, suffer the children to come unto me for of such is the kingdom of heaven. There must be a childlike nature, a childlike spirit that says, teach me, Lord. Teach me, Holy Ghost, how to stay where I should stay and be who I should be. Because even when I think I'm grown, I'm not grown. So don't get goofy and withdraw because you think you know more than everybody else. It is in that childlike place that God can continue to add to you. And had Elisha done that, how on earth would Elijah have been able to promote him? How would it have been able to recommend him? How could have Elijah said to him, when you see me when I go, you can have what you ask? He could have never promoted Elisha. Had Elisha got goofy and started withdrawing himself and started being unfaithful. Can you imagine Elijah saying, where is Elisha? He's supposed to be with me. I'm going down to Gilgal or I'm going over here. I, where is anybody seen him? No, Elisha never. Elijah never had to wonder where he was. He was where he should be. And the bottom line is learn what you need to learn and do what, you know, do what you got to do and, and do it over and over and, and over and over again uh, without losing your testimony in the process. And then God will bless you. There's seven things I'll ask you as a close here. Seven things. Number one, do you have a servant's heart? Are you a servant's heart by nature? Are you willing to serve? Is it in your heart to serve? And only you know the answer to that. Do you have it in your heart to serve? The second question that I would ask, are you willing and able to stand the test of time? How long will you stand? How long will you serve? If I can talk you out of serving, if I can talk you out of your calling, you are never called. Are you willing to stand when you're the only one? Are you willing to stand when your friends get goofy? Are you willing to stand when your family gets goofy? Are you able to stand the test of time? Here's a third question. Are you committed to the development process that is required of you? Will you be committed to developing yourself in 2020 leadership, in starting point, in, in ministry class? Will you, will you be committed to developing yourself whenever there's an opportunity for growth and teaching and classes are being offered, for mentorship, for coaching? Are you committed to that? Are you allowing yourself the opportunity for the Lord to develop you? Will you do it even if you don't want to do it? 
will you do what's required? The fourth question that I ask is, are your priorities in alignment to the Lord's authority over you? Are your priorities in alignment to the Lord's authority over you? The Bible said, seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things will be added unto you. Be careful that you don't run after everything else except for the Lord. When you run after the Lord, he'll add everything else to you, but you have to put him first. My mom and dad taught me to put the Lord first. They put the Lord first in their own life. Therefore, they could model putting the Lord in my life first. So I, I learned that from them. My, my priorities, going to church, being faithful in the word. You know, I don't miss church unless I'm sick on my deathbed or have to work. I don't miss church or on vacation so I can't get to church. I want you to understand something. Your priorities speak of where you are in your relationship with God. You can call it what you want. You can call it controlling. You can call it and say that some people just don't get it when in truth you don't get it because you're spiritually immature to not understand that unless the Lord is number one in your life and he is the ripple effect in your life, you can have all these other things, but you're going to miss out on the most important thing and that which is eternal. And so even with our children, my mom and dad were doing what they had to do and what they knew to do because they knew they were modeling to my sister and I on how to serve the Lord and to run after the Lord. So your priorities, are they in alignment to the Lord's authority over your life? The next question is this, are you faithful and fruitful where you are presently serving? Are you faithful and fruitful where you are presently serving? Or is there fruit? And number six, how close are you following your leaders? Are you following near or are you following far? That's very important when you're serving with devotion. And the number seven, will you follow to the end? In other words, when the dust settles, will you still be there? I think those are some things you've got to think about, probably very abrasive to some. Some people think that what I'm teaching is antiquity. It's not necessarily for today, but what I'm teaching works. What I'm teaching has proved itself over time. What I'm sharing with you by faith and in service as a servant unto the Lord is something that'll save your neck and help you and your family across the finish line. And so don't get hateful, be grateful. Don't become upset because someone challenges you to come up a little higher and rise to the occasion. Be thankful God put people in your life that love you enough to tell you the truth and to help you. And if you reject the Lord's word in your life, and if you reject God's authority in your life and those that the Lord has placed in you, over you, in the Lord, then you're not rejecting them, you're rejecting the one that sent them. And so we have to be careful that we stay at a place of service and be like Stephanus, who Paul said, Ooh, I want to thank God for Stephanus and his whole house. They were devoted unto the ministry. Is that what people can say about you? Let's pray. Father, help us, Lord. Teach us, grow us, train us, help us, equip us, chisel away some of this fleshly stuff that has gotten into our consumerness where we have felt like that we are doing it just to get something. Help us never to yield to that spirit, that shopping spirit. God, we don't serve you in any capacity and say, ha, I did this, God, you owe me. No, Lord, we serve you. We serve you because the Bible teaches us that you, for the joy that was set before you, humbled yourself and became obedient even to the death of the cross so that we might have life. And I'm so thankful that in the garden, when you prayed and said, not my will, but thy will be done, that you were submitting to God. And I'm thankful that you taught me and taught my mom and dad and taught others who taught them to submit ourselves to them have, that have rule over us in the Lord, that we might Speak the word of God in a unanimity that our yea is yea and our nay is nay. God, help me, Lord, to be submitted always and not to have a shopping spirit and look for what's in it for me. I don't sing just so I can get on the platform. I don't serve just so I can be noticed. I, I, I do it privately before it's ever public. 
God, help me to remember to serve with devotion and even to be remembered as Stephanus was to the Apostle Paul. Father, thank you today for your people. Thank you for this time on this beautiful Tuesday morning. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. God bless you today is my prayer. Thank you for tuning in to 2020. Please share this video and maybe be an encouragement to somebody else. God bless you. I love you. I look forward to seeing you soon. Take care.